Welcome to Dr. Karen Speaks Leadership, the show for you, the successful, savvy, senior business leader. Featuring the music of national recording artist, Ron McMillan, and I am your host, Dr. Karen wilson Stark. I'm really excited today because we're going to be talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And in fact, for the rest of this month, we're going to be talking about some aspect of what it takes to be a marketplace ministry leader. That's a lot of words for a very important concept. Many of you are Christians, you are believers, and you're in a secular work environment, not a Christian marketplace or workplace. And guess what? You are there for a reason. You are there for a purpose. There is a ministry for you to do in the setting where God has placed you. And just remember, we are living in a world where people are hurting. And just coming off the back end of the pandemic, I thought that people would be coming out and maybe be happy to be getting out and about in the public. And we're seeing lots of fights. We're seeing lots of shootings. We're seeing people under stress, people not at peace. So those of us who know God, we are able to bring the peace of God to the environment where he has called us. So just remember, you are ambassadors of God's love and of God's light in places where there may be hatred, there might be evil, and there might be darkness, or just places where people need a word of encouragement. So what you're doing is you are bringing that cool drink of water to someone who's been wandering around in the desert for a period of time. And in order to step into this ministry role, you have to be resourced for this mission. And so that's what I want to talk about today. What does that resourcing look like? So there are three areas that I'm really going to just touch on And we'll unpack these in greater detail as we get into later weeks. One area is called divine guidance. So just imagine, I'm going to just imagine you're going to see like three circles in a Venn diagram in front of you. See that in your mind's eye. One of those circles is divine guidance. That means that we're talking about divine wisdom. In order for you to move forward in marketplace ministry as a leader, you've got to be led, directed by God with God's wisdom. So that's number one. Number two would be what I would call divine provision, which is really about God's divine power. In order to do any work for him, we have to have his power in order to do it. And so that's what we're talking about there. And then the third circle, if you could imagine in the Venn diagram, that bottom circle, that is going to be what we call divine steps. So those divine steps, that's the action that we're taking. So first you have guidance, then you have God's divine provision, which is power, and then you have divine steps, which is action. So if you think guidance, provision, steps, That's GPS. So that is really our compass for how to move through in the environments in our workplaces where God has placed us. And I've already mentioned that there's such a need for workplace leaders today and for us to be there to bring those words of encouragement. And first, we've got to be in front of God hearing what he's saying to us So we know what to say and what to do with those around us. Now, I want to talk about what happens if you don't have all three of these circles operating at the same time. What if you only have two of them operating at the same time? So let's imagine that you've got guidance 
and you've got provision. So you've got the guidance, the wisdom, you've got the power. So what's missing are the steps or the action. So without any steps, without any action, you really don't have any impact. There's no feet, if you will, to your message and to your work. Secondly, just imagine that you had guidance and you had the action. However, you were missing the divine provision and the divine power. In that case, you're going to be worn out. You're going to be exhausted because you know where to go. Now you're acting to, to go there, but you don't have the supernatural power of God in order to do what he's asking you to do. So when you're in that situation, you never really reach your full potential because instead of operating in God's power, you're operating in your own power. And then the third condition where we don't have all three is when you've got provision, you've got God's power, and you've got the steps, so you've got the action, but you don't have the guidance. So in that case, you've got all of this power, you've got feet moving. However, since you didn't have the guidance on the front end, you may be focused on the wrong outcomes. You may be moving in the wrong directions. So your power and your action, in essence, are getting wasted. So in order for us to function optimally, we need all three on our GPS. We need the guidance, we need the power, and we need the steps. So think about that and think about where you are. Do you have all three in your life? Is something missing? Is there an area that perhaps might need to be punched up? Later in this month, we're going to talk about those in greater detail and give you some tips about how to punch up some of those areas and let you know what it looks like when it's working well. Also, I'm really excited to let you know that I am conducting interviews and I'm interviewing people who are Christian executives in mid to large size secular corporations. I want to learn more about your leadership journey and what are the challenges that you're facing? What is the cool drink of water that you're looking for as a marketplace ministry leader? So if you would like to be interviewed or if you know of someone else who you would like to recommend for an interview, then please reach me at Dr. Karen, that's D-R period, Karen at transleadership.com. And time is of the essence. So reach out to me as soon as you can. I'll get you on my calendar for these interviews. There's no obligation for the interview. There's nothing to purchase. I just want to connect with you and learn more about your journey. So that's Dr. Karen, D-R period, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. So before we close today, I want to share a couple of different verses with you where sometimes we have verses that are first noted in the first covenant of God, which we call the Old Testament. And the same concept of verse is also repeated in the New Testament. So today's reading does have those two components, and I'm going to look at both of them. And where I'm going to start is Isaiah 52, the seventh verse. And this is from the Old Testament. And it says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And then the parallel verse to that is found in Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 15. And this is in the New Testament. And it talks about being able to call upon God and being able to know who he is in order to do that. So it says, this is Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, 
who bring glad tidings of good things. So just remember, you, when you are in the marketplace as a marketplace ministry leader, it's your feet that are taking the steps in the workplace to bring good news, glad tidings to other people. So take that with you in your heart this week. Today I'm focused on leadership legacy. This is all about hearing people in your workplace and leaving those people, leaving the organizations and leaving yourself in a better position. So leadership legacy does include you, it doesn't exclude you. And remember last time I was talking about what's involved in being a marketplace ministry leader. And so we're just going to add another little nuance to it today. So when we talk about developing people in the organization, we're talking about seeing the strengths of those people, seeing the gifts that they bring to the workplace. And when we see those strengths, when we see those gifts, we want to see the beauty in each person and to further develop the beauty that they're bringing. You want to identify what do they need in order to continue to do their best or to step up and do even better than they have been doing? Some people need a word of encouragement and other people might need a little kick in the rear end, a little bit of a rebuke because they really haven't been living up to their potential and up to their true gifts. So it'll be different for each person. The bottom line, when you are a ministry leader in the workplace, you are functioning as a mirror and you're holding up a mirror so that people can see themselves so that you can then help them to call themselves to their higher selves. That's really what we're talking about in terms of being that marketplace ministry leader. When we look at it from the organizational lens, you're asking the organization that you're leading and you're saying, what is it that we stand for? How are we treating our customers? How are we treating our partners, our suppliers, our clients? There are some ethical ways of doing business, ethical ways of showing up. And you wanna be constantly evaluating whether or not you are actually leading in the ethical manner we're talking about. So you're holding up the mirror this time, not only just to individuals, but to the organization itself. How well are you living out the values that you espouse and that you say that you believe in? How consistent is that process? Then for yourself, when you have served and fulfilled your mission in the workplace, the question becomes, what is next for you? Just because you retire from the workplace doesn't mean that you retire from your legacy. It doesn't mean you retire from being a ministry leader in some other capacity. So when you are looking at legacy, you're leaving people better, you're leaving the organization better, and you're also defining what is next for you. And think about it this way. God works in a 360 degree way, meaning he's not gonna resource individuals in the organization and the organization and leave you out you too are going to be developed and resourced in some way as a result of your service so that at some point he can say, well done, good and faithful servant for the work that you have put in. So I want to just remind you that I am currently conducting a number of exciting interviews. I am interviewing people who are Christian leaders in mid to large size secular corporations. And I want to know more about your leadership journey. What are you challenged by at work? What makes it difficult to leave the legacy that you feel that you've been called to, to leave in the organization? What's getting in the way? And if you were to become more intentional, what might that look like? And what kind of legacy could you leave? So if you fit into that demographic, you're a Christian business leader, 
you're in a mid to large size secular corporation and you'd like to participate in the interview, then please contact me at Dr. Karen, D-R period, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. And I'll make sure I get you on my calendar to interview you for this very important project. And you know, I didn't mention this before. Anyone who's interviewed whatever information I discover and whatever I write up about it, all of the interviewees will receive that information. So as we're closing out today, I'd like to share with you a reading from Genesis, the 41st chapter, and this is from the life of Joseph. And we know that Joseph had been enslaved down in Egypt because his brothers had sold him into slavery. And at some point, he ends up working for the Pharaoh and he becomes the ruler in essence over all of Egypt because of the gifts and talents that he was bringing to the secular marketplace, if you will. So Genesis 41st chapter, starting with verse 33 says, now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. And I want to remind you, this is Joseph speaking, and he's saying this because he's interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and God has revealed to Pharaoh that there's going to be seven good years and then seven years of famine and lean years. So he's got the seven good years to prepare and get ready for the famine. So Joseph is saying to the Pharaoh, select somebody who's discerning, select somebody who's wise, set them over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was the one who had interpreted Pharaoh's dream. So Joseph goes on to say, let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food, shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, There is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. So what I say to you today is, when you are serving well, when you are using the gifts and talents that God gave you in the secular workplace, it benefits those leaders and those organizations and those countries that you serve. And it allows you to have an even greater platform very often and for God to be glorified through you. Earlier this month, I covered some episodes where we were talking about some issues such as Marketplace Ministry Overview, where I talked about the GPS, your divine GPS, which is for guidance, provision, and also steps, what steps to take. And so in the next several podcasts, I'm going to break that down further and say a little bit more about each of those parts. So if you haven't heard the episode from the 6th of July that was on Marketplace Ministry Overview, listen to that. Also listen to the 8th of July on Leadership Legacy, because again, these are foundational pieces. And then the last time I also covered the value of people. Before you can do any of the things that we've talked about, you have to understand how important people are in God's economy. So today, the emphasis is going to be on divine guidance and wisdom. 
And one thing that's important to remember is that God has really infused you with wisdom and the wisdom that you need in your marketplace to be a marketplace leader. And further, he says, where there's no vision, the people perish. So sometimes we're in the workplace and we've been given a vision that's important for that workplace to hear. So previously I did talk about Joseph and when Joseph was enslaved down in Egypt because his brothers had sold him into slavery and he had been doing well every place that he had been placed, including in Potiphar's house until Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him and then he resisted that and he ended up being imprisoned unjustly. So even though these negative things were happening to him, always remember that God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And Romans 8 tells us about that. So even though some things weren't going well, it was going to be used ultimately for his advantage and for the advantage of his father and his brothers uh, down the line. So not only did Joseph receive God's favor in so many other ways, he had the divine ability to interpret dreams. And because this was a skill, in essence, that the king really needed, when he interpreted dreams and found out about the famine that was going to be coming over all the land of Egypt, it allowed them to get ready, it allowed them to prepare in advance, and he was promoted to that leadership role. And so in other words, the wisdom that he got from God, because the interpretation of that dream came from God, that's what allowed him to benefit the Pharaoh of Egypt, the land of Egypt, and ultimately to benefit his own family as well, because they would later come to Egypt for food. Similarly, if we think about Nehemiah, Nehemiah was in the kingdom of King Artaxerxes, and he was what's called the cupbearer. So if you're the cupbearer, you make sure that the king is not getting poisoned food. And in order to prove that the food isn't poisoned, you taste it first. That's why you're called the cupbearer. So you drink the drinks, taste the food, make sure everything is fine. So that's a very trusted and important role, very close to the king of the cupbearer. And that's the role that Nehemiah had. While he was in this government job, if you will, he got word that things were not going so well back in Jerusalem. He found out that the wall had been broken down and was in great need of repair around the city. And his heart was really hurt behind hearing this news about back home and what was happening back home. When he got that bad report, about what was going on in Jerusalem, and he wanted to help, he wanted to do something, but he knew that before he acted and did anything, he would have to seek divine guidance. So in that case, he, he prayed. He prayed to God about what should he do. And then one day, as he was um, working in front of the king, the king saw that his countenance wasn't happy, and it was not a good idea as particularly in pagan kingdoms to be in the king's presence, not looking happy because the king could just say, off with your head. And so the king asked him, well, what is it? What is your concern? Now, mind you, Nehemiah had been praying all along. He was praying for God's direction, praying for God's guidance on what he should say, what he should do. And so ultimately he told the king his concern about Jerusalem. And then when the king asked him, well, what do you want to do? He requested a leave of absence to go back and to help rebuild the wall and to take care of matters back in Jerusalem. And as a result of all of this, he ended up getting uh, letters that he needed to be able to present to the local governors because the local governors in the region, they were gonna be against this move. And he had to make it clear that he had the king's blessing for the mission that he was on. He also had to get permission to use wood out of the king's forest. So he had papers for that because it was dangerous traveling at that time, the king sent him with the military guard, a detachment of soldiers to protect him and going back to Jerusalem. And when he went back there, and I mentioned he's a government official, he's a government leader. He worked though with the prophets of the time and the priest. So he worked with Ezra and he worked with others in the region to make sure that all 
that needed to be done for the wall in Jerusalem, that those things actually happened. Now, he had a lot of skill. He knew how to organize people. He knew how to put things together in a way such that the work got done. And he divided the work amongst the people after he had surveyed the situation, decided the best way to proceed and how to operate. So what I'm saying is that God has gifted you with the abilities that you have to work in the secular workplace. And on top of those government leader type skills that you might have, he's also given you through prayer, divine guidance and divine wisdom so that when you mix the two of them together, you become of great benefit. And all those beyond what we're gonna to cover today if you were to read the record, Nehemiah did get the wall built against tremendous opposition because the local people around did not want the wall of Jerusalem built. They wanted Jerusalem to still remain vulnerable to their attacks. They wanted to be able to pop over in there anytime they felt like it and do whatever they wanted to do. However, Nehemiah made sure that that wall was put up and that the, the gates were, were repaired and all the things like that that needed to happen. So when you're thinking about your workplace, I want you to, to ask yourself, what are the circumstances that you see around you in your workplace? And how have you prayed about those circumstances and about those needs and about what's going on in the workplace? Because it's in that place of prayer that the divine wisdom comes to us. And then thirdly, just thinking about yourself, what are those leadership skills that you have for the task that's being done at your workplace? Because you were there, that business is blessed. Because you are there, that business has an opportunity to be even more profitable because of your presence. So what wisdom is God showing you for your workplace? And I want you to understand that the wisdom of God is not the same as the wisdom of men. Men have one kind of wisdom, God has another kind of wisdom. And if we really are to be most effective as ambassadors here on this earth, representing the kingdom of God, we must have the wisdom of God. So before I end today, I want to remind you again that I am still conducting those interviews with those of you who are Christian leaders in mid to large size corporations in a secular marketplace. So if you're working in the secular marketplace and you already know that defined guidance, for example, is important for you every day, and you're willing to share something about your leadership journey in an interview, and these interviews are not long, it'll take about 30 minutes, just a half an hour, please reach out to me at Dr. Karen, D-R period, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. And if you're not an appropriate person for the interview, but you know someone else who is, please pass the word on to other people so that others can apply to have an interview. So I'd like to end today with a reading from 1 Corinthians. It's the second chapter, starting with verse 6, and it says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, and not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, 
but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So just remember, in your workplace, you are there with the mind of Christ. You have the mind of God and the wisdom of God. And through prayer to God, he gives you the divine guidance that you need to operate optimally in your workplace and to make the best decisions. This month, we've been doing a series on leadership legacy and also on divine guidance provision and also divine steps. So if you haven't listened to the prior episodes going back to the July the 6th, then please go back and listen to the previous episodes. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about divine provision, which is power. And last time, I talked about the power of prayer in Nehemiah's life, how he went from prayer, if you will, to power. And the bottom line is when there's no prayer in our life, there's no power in our lives as well. So in his case, he had God's guidance and direction, and he also got the power of God to do the things that he needed to do to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And today what I want to talk about is an incident in the life of the disciples of Jesus. Once Jesus resurrected from the grave and from the dead, he was on the earth for about 40 days or so and was seen by about 500 different people. And when he was meeting with his disciples at an appointed place, he gave them what we now refer to also as the Great Commission. And that's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And he told them to go into all the world to preach the gospel. And he told them that he had all authority in heaven and also on earth. And he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, this was their guidance. This is what they were to do. They were to go out and share this good news. However, he didn't say, go out right now and do it. First, he told them, he says, stay in Jerusalem. Don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the power that I'm sending you from on high, the power of the Holy Ghost. And of course, they were praying together in the upper room. And while they were in this time of prayer, it was on the day of Pentecost, so many days after the Passover period of time, they heard the sound of this rushing mighty wind and these tongues that were like fire were sitting on each of them. And they were able to speak in the languages of the different people who were there. Now, mind you, the people had come to Jerusalem from all over because of the Passover. And so people were from various regions where they spoke different languages. But each person was able to hear this good news message in their own language. That was a miracle. It was a miracle that was fueled by the power of God. And it was the power that Jesus had told them to wait for until they received it. He didn't really want them going out on this mission he sent them on until he had divine power. So remember last time we talked about divine wisdom. You need more than just earthly wisdom. You need divine wisdom and you need more than earthly power. You need divine power. So some of the gifts that come with Holy Spirit power, and this is not a comprehensive or exhaustive list, would be things like the word of wisdom or the word of knowledge in a very particular circumstance. Even those times when King said, not only interpret the dream, but tell me what the dream was and then interpret it. 
you know, that's not natural wisdom. That's going to be some divine wisdom to have the right word at the right time. You can have gifts of tremendous faith or the ability to heal people or to conduct miracles, gifts of prophecy or speaking in different languages of people that you didn't learn and you didn't study in school, gifts of helps, being able to help in different situations or administration, all kinds of gifts. And we learned from 1 Corinthians 13 that the greatest of these is always love. So whatever gifts that you receive from the power of God, those gifts will benefit you and the people around you, the people in God's kingdom and family, and also you being in the marketplace as a marketplace leader. You're showing up with power that's beyond just what you have yourself. So again, it becomes a question of taking an inventory. What needs do you see in your workplace? And what spiritual gifts have you been given to make a difference there? What prayers, again, are you praying for your workplace? All of this is very important because you need the guidance and you also need the power to carry out whatever it is that God is leading you to do. So again, I want to remind you that this month I am conducting interviews with people who are Christian leaders in the secular marketplace. If you're in a mid to large size secular corporation and you are a Christian leader and you'd like to be interviewed, then please contact me at Dr. Karen, D-R period, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. And I'd like to close out today's session with Second Peter, the first chapter and verse two. And it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we have everything that we need for life and for godliness. So go forward and make a difference. So after you've gotten divine guidance and you've gotten divine power, it's time to take some steps and get into some divine steps and action. Last time we were talking about being empowered for that action and we we reviewed a few of the kind of gifts that you can get from the power of God. And the greatest gift we mentioned was the gift of love. Now, in order to have divine steps, you have to commit yourself to walk in that spirit of God, to walk in the way that he's leading you and the way that he's directing, to walk in his power. And when you have the spirit of God, in you and with you, you do supernatural things. One example of something supernatural, and I alluded to it last time, was that Daniel, he not only interpreted the king's dream, but he also told the king what the dream was about. And if you remember, back in the time of the Babylonian kingdom, The king had all kinds of wise men and all kinds of wise people around him that he would consult whenever he had anything difficult in the kingdom to consider or decisions to make. So he gave his wise men a really tough assignment. He said, I want you to interpret my dream, but I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You have to tell me the dream and interpret it. And they were saying, King, be reasonable. Nobody can do that. I mean, tell us the dream and we'll be happy to interpret it. And the king says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he went on further to say, if you can't do this, I'm going to kill you. And of course, Daniel hears about it. And he asks the king for a little bit of time because he's going to do what we said before. He's going to go and pray to God for divine guidance and divine power 
divine resourcing to know what to do. And through the prayers, God reveals to him both what the dream was and also the interpretation of the dream. And so he was able to tell that to the king. Again, that's an example of something that's very divine, something that's very supernatural, or even Daniel later when he was thrown in the lion's den and he wasn't consumed, or his colleagues, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown in the fiery furnace, and they weren't burned up either because there were supernatural events that were taking place in the midst of all of this. We also find that in King David's time, in comparison to the first king, which was King Saul, people were, the women of the area were saying, you know, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has tens of thousands in so many words. And Saul didn't like that. But the point was that the spirit of God was with David at that point. And so David was more victorious and he had more success even than Saul had had because God had taken his spirit and his power away from Saul because Saul had been disobedient. And in fact, after David committed the sin of adultery with Bathsheba and later had her husband killed in the battle, and that was murder, what he did, because he ordered him to be killed in that way, let the enemies kill him and all Israel was to pull back from him. That was a very evil thing and God wasn't happy about it. So in David's prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, one of the things he says is, take not your Holy Spirit away from me, because that's how important the Holy Spirit was. And he knew that he could do none of the things he was doing. He would not have the closeness with God, the relationship with God without that spiritual connection that allowed him to commune with God and to be friend to friend really with God in that relationship. He valued God's divine presence in his life. Now, another person who had the spirit of God at the time of birth and even before was Samson. Samson was a Nazarite and his parents were told, your son's gonna be a Nazarite. Don't give him any alcohol. He had all kinds of rules on his hair grow, all kinds of things he was supposed to do as a Nazarite because God planned to work through him to deliver his people. However, Samson, unlike David, he didn't choose to walk by the Spirit. And because he did all kinds of stuff, whatever he thought that he wanted to do, and he really particularly had a weakness for a lot of foreign and strange women, he would uh, get himself into all kinds of trouble following behind beautiful but evil women such as Delilah. And so as a result of Delilah, she actually was responsible for the Philistines being able to come in and to blind him, poke his eyes out and imprison him and so on. This would not have happened if he had continued to walk by the spirit of God, but instead he was out doing his own thing and he wasn't valuing the presence of the spirit of God in his life. And he wasn't allowing God's spirit to order his steps. So we want to make sure that we have our minds oriented, you know, by God towards his divine wisdom. And we want to have the power of God also orchestrating our lives. And then we want our steps to also be ordered by God in the workplace and what we're doing. Today, I want to share with you some verses about the fruit of the Spirit and what that is and what it means to walk by the Spirit. And before I do that, I just want to remind you again that I am doing those interviews this month. So if you are a Christian leader in a mid to large size corporation, if you are in a secular corporation and you are willing to share a half hour of your time with me, I'd like to interview you to learn about your leadership journey. What are the challenges that you're experiencing right now? What are the aspirations that you have? And what is the legacy that you want to leave? So if you'd like to spend that 30 minutes in an interview, then contact me at Dr. Karen, D-R period, K-A-R-E-N, at transleadership.com. And I'm going to read today's verses, and then I have my thought questions for you after that. So this comes from Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse 16, and it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. 
and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. And I'll pause here for a second just to remind you, remember Samson, he was trying to do a little bit of both at the same time and over time that doesn't work. Usually then one is gonna win out over the other. And in his case, the flesh won out over the spirit. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So here are my questions for you as you think about your life in the workplace. How are you walking in the spirit and manifesting the fruit of the spirit in your workplace? How else can you show more love patience, and hope in the workplace? How closely are you representing the heavenly kingdom from which you are an ambassador? There are times in our lives when we're headed in a certain direction and we think it's the right direction. However, it really isn't. And often we have to have some significant experiences and learn some new information before we realize that we're headed in the wrong direction. So I wanna to talk today about the Apostle Paul, who prior to being known as the Apostle Paul was known as Saul. Saul was his given name and his birth name. And Saul, early in his life, he was a person who was very zealous for God. He considered himself a strong servant of God. And he wanted to defend the truth of God and what God was saying to people in his word. So when this new upstart religion began that got to be known as the way and later came to be known as Christianity, he wasn't very happy about it because he felt as though they were diverting people from God's truth. So I wanna walk through his story and talk a little bit about what happened in his life and what changed and then make an application to what does this mean for the business person as well. First, let's talk a little bit though about Paul's history. And I'll refer to him as Paul, even though at this point of the story, he is still being called Saul. Paul was one of those people who had been circumcised on the eighth day. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. With respect to the law, he referred to himself as blameless. He had so much zeal for God that he very relentlessly persecuted the church. And in fact, when Stephen was stoned to death, Paul was present there and he was holding the coats of some of the ones who were the perpetrators. He was so successful at his persecution that he was feared by the churches everywhere. Later in Acts 26, when he's talking to King Agrippa and he's describing 
his life story and what all happened to him. He says, I thought that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I did this in Jerusalem. I shut up saints in prison and I had authority from the chief priest. I put people to death, casting my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and I compelled them to blaspheme and to deny the faith. I was exceedingly outraged against them to the point where I even went to foreign cities to chase them down and to persecute them. And in Acts 8, he says, I made great havoc of the church, entering every house and trying to pull people out. And he would get authority permits from the chief priest to do all of this. And as a result of all of these persecutions, the church was scattered from here to there. The upside of that is that the, the good news message was being spread throughout the world because people had to disperse and had to leave from outside of Jerusalem. In Acts, the ninth chapter, we see that Paul is there breathing threats and he's planning additional murders of the disciples. And he had gotten some additional letters from the high priest and is on his way to the synagogue in Damascus. And his mission was to bring any followers of this way, he was going to bind them and bring them back to Jerusalem. That was the plan. However, as he was on the Damascus road with a couple of companions and headed to Damascus, he saw a really bright light and he heard a voice speaking to him. And the voice was saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, well, who are you, Lord? Who are you speaking? Because he knew it must be some important person speaking out of nothingness like this, a voice like from the sky. And then the voice said to him, I am Jesus who is speaking to you. Now, of course, Saul would have been shocked by that. At this point, you have to understand, this is after the crucifixion, this is after the resurrection and after Jesus' ascension back into heaven. And yet he is speaking now to Paul on the Damascus road. So when he identifies himself, because Jesus also tells him, you know, how long are you going to kick against the goads, also known as pricks? Back in those days in this agrarian society where there were a lot of animals, if the animal was going the wrong way, you would kind of use this device to, to steer it in the right direction, but it had sharp points on the end and you could be hurt by those sharp points. So basically Jesus says, look, you've been kicking against me all this time and how long are you going to do that and harm yourself? And so then Paul says, well, what do you want me to do? And so he told him, Jesus said, I want you to go into the city and I want you to go to a certain person's house, Simon the Tanner by the sea, and I want you to stay there. And then a man is going to come and tell you what else you need to do. In the meantime, Ananias, who was a servant of God, got a visitation from God as well. And he was told, go over to this house, Simon's house. And there I want you to talk to Paul and to tell him what he needs to do in order to obey me and do the right thing. And so Ananias says, you mean Paul, the one who's persecuting the church and doing this, that, and the other? Yes, that Paul. Well, he wasn't feeling too comfortable, let's say, about that mission and going on that mission. And then God said to him, don't worry about it. I have it taken care of. Paul is a chosen vessel to me. This is all in my will. You'll be fine. So Ananias goes over to the house, finds Paul. And mind you, I didn't mention this, but when Paul had seen the bright light on the Damascus road and after the voice had left him, he was blind and he couldn't see anymore. And so for several days, he's now fasting. He's not eating, he's not drinking, and he's blind. So Ananias comes in, he puts his hands on Paul, heals him from that blindness so that now he can see. And he tells him what he must do to be saved. And so Paul gets up, he gets baptized, 
It's God's intention that he be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that he can then go out and do the mission that he's called for. Much to everyone's shock and surprise, Paul starts immediately starting to teach the truth of the scriptures and how Jesus is the Messiah and the fulfillment of that. And you have to understand, Paul was a very educated man. He had been trained by the greatest teachers of his time, Gamaliel being one of them. And as he called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, he knew the Hebrew scriptures and what they said. And so he wasn't somebody you could easily fool in that sense. Now he was using that knowledge to see how all of these things tied together. And now he was going into the synagogue with this message. And of course, they were furious that he's bringing this message there. And the believers in the synagogue who were now in this new way, they were afraid of him because they thought this is a trick. He's probably pretending to believe so that he can harm us. So Paul was in danger on all different sides because people now wanted to kill him or get rid of him. He ended up having to go away for a period of time. God taught him even more perfectly in his absence. And then he comes out in a really powerful ministry. All of his life, his heart's desire was that his fellow Jewish believers would understand what he understood and that they would also see how Jesus was the Messiah. So in every city that he went to, he always went to the synagogue first. He always tried to talk to his brethren first. He was imprisoned many times. He went through many dangers because he loved them so much and he cared for them so much. And he was willing to lay down his life for them in order to share the message. Now, of course, most didn't hear it, although some did. And when people in the synagogue wouldn't hear him, he would then take the message to the Gentiles in the region and speak to them about God's blessing that had come to earth. And you have to remember, going all the way back to Abraham, it was always God's intention to bless the entire world, all nations, the Jew first and then the Gentile through the Messiah. And so Paul was teaching that. So we see that here's a man who was going one direction and he did a 180 going in a completely different opposite direction after he had this encounter on the Damascus road with Jesus. And in our own lives, there are times when we are going the wrong way or maybe doing some things because we don't have the additional knowledge that would allow us to do something different. We could call some of these things mistakes. They could be missteps. And in some cases, maybe even failures. And what I want to say is no matter what the mistake, no matter what the misstep, there's always a way to turn around and go the right way. And all of his life, Paul would end up saying, I am the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church. And yet, he really went on to write the bulk of the New Testament in the Bible. And he had three major missionary journeys going to develop and support the churches worldwide. And even more besides that. I think about this gospel song that's, we fall down, but we get up. And a saint is just a sinner who fell down, but got up. So the failure is not in the falling down. The failure is if you don't get up. The failure is if you hear what the right thing is and you decide to go the wrong way anyway, that's a failure. But to make the mistake and to not know is not a failure. So it's what we do with these circumstances that makes the difference. So you might be wondering, what is the application for those of us who are in the workplace? These principles, how do they apply? Even at work, number one, you can be zealously headed in the wrong direction. That can happen at work. You can think that this is the right business opportunity or this is the way to pursue it. This is the way to do something. There may be others around you who are seeing things differently. They may be trying to enlighten you, give you new information. That can happen at work. So secondly, you can be enlightened and you can see a new path when that new information comes. And as that new information comes, then number three, you can change course because of the new 
information, insight, truth that you've been exposed to. And number four, remember that past because you want to use your past as your fuel and as your motivation and maybe even to warn some other people who say, oh, I think we should go this. Oh, I went that way. Let me tell you what happened or why that may not be the best way to go. So number five, you want to encourage others with your story, with your journey. Their past doesn't have to define them just like yours doesn't have to define you. You don't have to be stuck. And number six, let your past experiences show you how to have empathy for other people so that you can walk in humility also. Because you know what? None of us is perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And to really recognize when we've been off base ourselves, it's an opportunity to empathize with others and to have humility in our walk. And then that leads to number seven, where you can let your past inspire great thanksgiving in you for where you are today and for some of the disaster that may have been averted because you found the new way to walk. So I want to close our session out today with 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 18. And it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So as you have been reconciled, also reconcile others, your brothers and sisters, those you love, those you care about as well. Thank you.